more intimate people, uh, Joe Kursky. Um, and he uh, uh, he will give a, a short introduction about himself and for the rest of the hour he will uh, present on uh, geographical information systems in education. So the floor is yours, uh, Joseph. Well, greetings and salutations. Many thanks for inviting me, Vincent and others. I, it's a huge honor to be connected with you all, not just today, but in the future. And I look forward to further discussions, collaboration. I've been asked to address this topic here, challenges and progress in educating spatial thinkers. That's a big effort. It's a global effort and it involves all of us here in the geo geospatial community. So it's not just me and my team, which I'll describe here in the next three hours. Just kidding, we don't have three hours. Just wanted to make sure you folks are on your toes. But again, it's a great honor to be here and I'm looking forward to chatting with you in the future. Let me just ask you a few questions. Uh, you all are geospatial professionals. Why should we care about educating the next generation of spatial thinkers? We could have lots of discussion on that. I'll just lay out a few reasons why I believe this is important and my own role in, in doing this. First of all, the UN SDGs and other issues and problems from global to local. They're all spatial issues, right? Water, energy, climate, population change, deforestation, political instability. They're all spatial, they're all complex, and hence geospatial technology can help us to solve those pressing issues. However, I do believe, and I'm sure you folks can relate, that we do feel empowered by the wonderful community that we have here, the wonderful tools that we have, the, the spatial data at our fingertips, much of which now is, is data as services. So that's a huge leap forward. But we also feel challenged, not just with COVID, but with natural hazards, with various uh, other things that we could chat about here in the session that we do feel a bit vulnerable in the last few years, right? We feel we feel challenged as well as empowered. So it's an interesting sort of a mixture. Now, each one of you has an education connection, right? You've got kids, you know people with children, you, you have an alma mater, you have a school down the street from where you work. Uh, and if none of those apply, you've got a, a, a concern for your own workplace and the future employees in your workplace and empowering those future employees to be spatial thinkers, to be critical thinkers, to be able to ask meaningful questions, solve problems, be organized, be ethical, and all those other things that bring us together as a community. And you also care about these global issues. You care about creating this more sustainable, resilient world. So you do care about the future of our planet and its people. You're all caring people and you care about others and you care about the earth, right? So all those reasons, education is going to continue. I think many of you know that education, just like many other societal institutions and structures that we've set up over the centuries is in rapid flux and is in rapid reinvention with demographic changes, with changes in expectations of society, how is education going to chart its way forward? How is it going to be continue to be relevant in society? And also, I think many of you are keenly uh, on board with this, that geotechnologies is going to continue. We may not call it GIS in the future, uh, business intelligence, spatial analytics, but it's going to continue in some form, no matter what we call it in the future, as a relevant set of tools, data, and methodologies, right? We're going to always be grappling with the whys of where, right? The whys of where. And so I would just salute you all. You are revolutionary people. A lot of people dream about changing the world. A lot of people want to change the world. I believe that the geospatial community is changing the world. You folks are solving these key issues of our time and empowering others to think critically and spatially as well. I wrote a whole book on this topic, so I'm very passionate about this. And this is about the revolutionary moments, technologies, people, inventions, ways of thinking that have transformed our world over the over the centuries, indeed over the millennia. Now, I also am very honored to be with you all because I believe you all are leaders. You're leaders in your institutions, your organizations, your nonprofit, your educational institutions, your private industry, 
your government agencies, et cetera, your, your leaders. And I believe this is a key time to show leadership from the geospatial community because, again, people need to hear that geospatial is a relevant way of looking at the world and solving problems. You're changing the way people see the world, right? That's your job day to day. So now focusing on education, what do we want education to look like in the next few years leading up to 2030 and beyond? We want to provide education that is relevant, that's affordable, that reflects and also anticipates workforce demands. How can you all help lead the way there? There's a couple of ways that I do it in my own role on the ESRI education team, and I also teach adjunct as an adjunct instructor in several colleges and universities, more about that in a bit. But I like to make it personal. Think about your own story. Now, some of you know me, some of you know that uh, I have a past where my, my parents actually owned a motor hotel or a motel. When I was a child, my front yard was a parking lot, but that really fostered my love for people and the planet, hearing about their stories and where they traveled from, where they're traveling to. So I met a lot of people when I was a child that were at our, our hotel, at our institution. And so I made maps as a child of made up places with railroad yards and university campuses, freeways, interchanges, open spaces. I also took a lot of photographs of that were rather unique that none of my friends actually like to do this kind of thing at a certain angle off of an office building or a certain place in the community where I knew that a certain canyon or mountain would be visible at a certain time of day with the sun angle being just right. So those are all my photographs when I was a child and just as a way of encouragement, just to show you what I do when I work with students and faculty at all levels and in all disciplines, is I don't bore them with my own background, but I, I show this in to encourage them in two ways. I kind of feel like my role is a, is a Barnabas, you know, as an encourager. So I'll talk more about that in a bit. But encouraging people that, A, they don't have to stay at the same job position through their whole career. I've had toes in four different waters, nonprofit, government agencies, academia, and in private industry at ESRI on the education team. And the second thing I like to show or point out from this infographic, if you will, is that geospatial technologies and spatial thinking has been important in all of the sectors and in all the organizations in which I've worked. This is my hometown here, Western Colorado, USA. Now, I, in my role as Education manager at ESRI, I feel very honored to be in this position because I actually have, an, I think, a potential impact and an encouraging word for students, faculty, deans, provosts, university presidents, facility managers on campuses, K, primary and secondary teachers, and their students as well. So every year I visit about 35 campuses face to face. So we were just chatting. Vincent and I, before all of you came on, that I've been to the Netherlands. I've been to many places around the world visiting schools, libraries, museums, and universities. And I, again, I feel that it's a very, uh, it's not a position that everybody gets to do. And so I, I'm very thrilled and honored to be a part of that team at ESRI that gets to do that, that is allowed to do that, is supported to doing that. So I meet a lot of different people and I have the opportunity to encourage them especially if they're feeling a bit um, a bit stressed in education. Education is a difficult place to be, not just now, but in the past. It's not easy to be an instructor. It's not easy to be a researcher in uh, in the community. So I one of my roles is really to feel, you know, again, that I I don't, I don't take this position for granted. It's 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 one that allows me to be in touch with a lot of different people and listen to their needs. What are their concerns? What are their stresses? What what are their success stories to be sure? But I also like to hear about what are their, are their challenges? And one of my roles is to help them to navigate the waters forward in what do I teach in terms of geography, ge environmental science, earth science, and using geotechnologies in those disciplines, business, engineering. How do I use geospatial technology to foster critical and spatial thinking? What kinds of curricular items can I provide? What kind of data sets can I point them to? What kind of advice can I give them about way to structure their programs or their courses moving forward? So again, I, I'm very honored to be a part of this community. And I also like to point them out to, that, especially for students, that GI, GI science and systems is a technology that can be mightily used for good. 
the Jane Goodall Elephant Foundation, the UN Environmental Program, right, the World Health Organization, you know, 99 point X percent of GIS is being used for good on the planet and to help people. In terms of ESRI, we have a lot of initiatives. The nonprofit program dates from 1992 at ESRI, where we donate or sharply reduce the cost and also provide support. It's not just dumping software on people. It's how do we connect you with the wider community so you can actually achieve your dreams and goals? The education program that I'm on, it also dates from 1992. I wasn't here at this in this role back then, but it is a long-standing support for and a partnership with educational institutions. It's not just having our name on a plaque on the wall or donating money to a lab. We don't really care about that kind of thing. Nothing against companies and organizations that want to do that, but our support is a long-term support. We're actually real people. It's not just some bot on a web page, right, that says, may I help you? That's not a real person, right? We're actually real people, and we really are seeking the long-term partnership with educational institutions so they feel supportive, supported and nurtured that they can count on us if they get stuck or if they need advice or something. We're here for them. So that's our, our role that we take very seriously. So that's our role on the education team. It's software, curricular pieces, spatial data, strategies, giving them confidence and connecting them with the community. They don't feel alone. I also just advise that, uh, you know, if you want to be connected to the education community, Anchor, their, uh, anchor the approach to some of the things that bring us to this, what I believe is a key pivotal moment in technology, that people are more aware of geospatial tools, even if they're not in GI science. They're enabled to use some of these tools, even if it's a fitness app or it's, it's a ride share or having a package delivered or na navigating their way across campus or to their grandmother's house, right? They're enabled to use at least some of these tools that you and I have at our fingertips. And the geotechnology is having advented to the this largely cloud-based environment now allows us to collaborate and share and indeed i believe gis is a is a discipline breaking or at least challenging kind of disruptive technology it allows people across different disciplines to work together as never before right the social scientists and the physical scientists the engineers the people in instructional design collaborating to building this better future in society through education so it is a naturally disruptive kind of a thing that is not just one or two places on campus. Indeed, I'm trying to get people to think about GIS in two different ways. One, a deeper way. So GIS being a whole platform, gathering data in the field, mapping it, analyzing it, creating communication devices, story maps, dashboards, web mapping applications, instant apps of various kinds to communicate the results to others. So uh, the deeper notion of geotechnology, not just in education teaching version X of software Y, but rather this whole deeper notion. And the second notion that I'm doing my utmost to share with people is the broader notion of geos geospatial technology, that it's not just in one or two that it shouldn't just be in one or two departments on a campus. It should be in sociology, civil engineering, data science, business. Just taking the business schools, for example, imagine if every school of business around the world was teaching with some sort of location analytics in their supply chain courses or their target marketing courses, their business management courses, risk assessment, and many other places in business that this could be used. So the broader notion of GIS and the deeper notion of GIS. And citizen science being able to use tools like Survey123 to have students and faculty and others, even in the community, to collect data on birds, trash, dangerous intersections, where do you feel safe in your community, et cetera. All kinds of things that they could gather data and then map it and then take action on it. That to me is the key here, taking action, not just gaining more head knowledge, but I'm always encouraging students and faculty to think about that higher, more noble goal of taking action about, you learn about the urban greenway potential in your community. Let's take action. Let's get people excited about maybe we should actually build an urban greenway. How would we do that? What kind of people do we need to get together to make that happen in our community? And then finally, storytelling. This whole presentation, as you can see here in the URL in the upper bar there, is a story map. Probably many of you on this call in this session today, and again, very wonderful to be with you all, have made a story map or some sort of web mapping application that's interactive in the past or you will do so in the future. I also like to anchor these approaches that tie GIS into education and society and building a better world into 
what I consider to be five key trends. And you may debate that these are the the, the top five. You, we could have a discussion on, hey, Joseph, maybe you're leaving out this one. But 3D, we've got a 3D world that we're living in. So I, I like to focus on the 3D analytics. We've had 3D visualization for many years, but what about 3D analytics? We've got those now. The merging, or at least the joining at, in some points on BIM, CAD, the interior space mapping, and the exterior space mapping. So GIS being able to talk and have tools that are in common with the people mapping the interior spaces. And third, the ability to stream in real-time data from Internet of Things feeds, the stream gauges, right? The wildfire perimeters, the traffic, the weather, and other things that are now becoming commonplace, but it, it was a huge leap forward, right? And a tremendous leap forward having that real-time data because that's what people want to map, right? They want to map things now or as near to now as possible. And fourth, the idea of having more and more people in an organization empowered, at least to some extent, in using GIS. That's what I call the enterprise nature of GIS, not just one or two people in a government agency or a nonprofit that know about GIS, but more and more people at least be some somewhat familiar with this. And again, that's the opportunity that we have as the geospatial community to educate those people in, hey, maybe you're not thinking about something called a map projection. Here's, here's why you might think about that for this map that you've just created, or maybe you're symbolizing this in this rainbow color, and maybe that's not suitable for soil moisture. Is red more, uh, uh, you know, a certain attribute is, is, is more of something if it's red than blue? No, maybe, ch maybe choose a different kind of color ramp, and here's why that matters. So those kinds of things we can show leadership in. And finally, artificial intelligence and machine learning. That could be a whole topic for a for a webinar, and you've probably had those topics in the past in this community that you've formed. That has tremendous implications for our future, correct? Not just in geospatial, but just focusing on geospatial, having students being able to create a map that's not even real, having a Python, a Jupyter notebook um, that you can say, okay, I want that notebook to uh, create a map that has three points of interest in my community. Okay, now that we can create those things rather, rather e easily, what are the implications for teaching and learning? What do we want students to know about and learn about and be able to do in the future? Use these tools effectively. I love having the AI powered tools in the, for example, ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Pro, where you've got feature extraction modules that are built on artificial intelligence that extract features rather quickly and easily. You can capture 98 or 99% of all the trees in an area from, an, from a satellite image, right? Or a, the buildings or the vehicles or something else. That's going to transfer, it already is transforming entry level GIS positions to be more analytical rather than just gathering the data as they have been for decades. So it has tremendous uh, uh, utility for sure. Okay, well, what about this? I would say also that I'm trying to illustrate to folks what phase two of GIS is, and there are numerous examples, but just taking one key issue that affects real lives, real families. It's affected my family, perhaps your family, where in the past we could map traffic accidents. We could create graphs like this. We could also, uh, for one particular county, we could say, or administrative area, we could map based on fatalities, injuries, if there was any substances involved, any pedestrians involved. So we could make a map like this and we could symbolize them in different ways. But now what we can do, of course, is a lot of different things that we couldn't do in what I called phase one of GIS. We could create hexagons, for example, and we could extrude those hexagons and create hotspots. So if we wanted to have students think about and faculty think about, okay, you've got a project and you've got a time and constraints on budget and constraints on the uh, deadline, et cetera. You've got constraints. If I want to focus on making my community safer, maybe I'm going to focus on these consecutive hotspot intersections in my community. So that's, the, uh, I, to me, an example of GIS helping people make smarter decisions in a time-constrained way, which all projects have. And that's not something we could do with phase one of GIS, where we could just map these things in 2D we can do th things in a different way now. And also one of the key roles, and I know I'm doing a lot of talking now and I look forward to discussing with you uh, here in a moment or two, but is listening to educators and speaking their language, understanding what their constraints are. And for example, 
when I work with primary and secondary educators is in particular, it's they're tied to educational content standards in their state, in their country on science, social studies. They have to teach a certain set of content for year seven or year nine students in sociology or in geography, et cetera. So you've got to understand where they're coming from. They, we can't just go in there and say, well, you need to be using GIS for these lessons. No, it's, hey, you're, you're using, you're, you're teaching plate tectonics, for example. Uh, why don't you use the living atlas of the world? That is a dynamic set of content that you could actually teach from. Nothing against this map of plate boundaries that's on page 300 of your textbook, but it's, it's, it's static. It's from 1990. Uh, and there are other limitations of that static map. Here you've got this dynamic content that you could then add. Ooh, let's look at population change or population numbers near these hazardous earthquake and volcanic areas. And let's think about the impact of that hazard on people. So that's the kind of thing where, okay, it's a short component that's in addition um, that, well, it doesn't replace what they're doing, but it, it it enhances what they're doing. It helps students get more engaged. And so my focus with educators is if every educator wants to teach in a more engaging way. They want students to actually care about the content. And so that's where some of these resources ac actually can help educators see that, okay, that's where I'm going to use a little bit of spatial data, geotechnologies. I'm not going to turn my students into GIS people. My goal is to teach plate tectonics, uh, natural hazards, energy, water, population change, et cetera, things that I'm already teaching in this more engaged way where students are actually solving problems as a climate scientist would, as a demographer would, as a environmental planner would, et cetera. I also say to educators and others, including you all here, is that despite the rise of geo-awareness, we still have this need for articulating what you do and why it matters, right? There's still this attitude of, hey, I've got Google Maps on my phone. Uh, why do I need you, geospatial professional? Now on my Our Earth channel, which has thousands of videos on it, a set of those is me in actual elevators, which I know sounds pretty geeky and nerdy, but I would encourage you also to, you know, use my own as examples, but make it your own voice, make it your own 30 second, your one minute, your two minute, your five minute, your two hour workshop. Make it your own articulated voice as to why this all matters. I also like to focus on what's important, not just, look, my data's on the map and therefore I'm good. That's it. No, but what what's the end goal is remember to understand something in a deeper, richer way, not just to get your water quality points on the map or your dangerous intersections or your community gardens or whatever you're mapping, right? It's there's the higher, more noble goal. And also don't focus on the tools. That's my message for a lot of educators these days. The tools change, the tools morph. And that's, I think, a, a welcome message for educators that are like, well, GIS is changing so rapidly. How would I teach with it when it's changing so quickly? Don't worry so much about the tools. And that's my, one of my uh, uh, photographs that I, I've taken in an actual secondary school is probably some of you recognize this as an old Mac computer. Now it's a doorstop. The point is the tools change. This is the most important tool of all, right? Your brain and the brain of these students and faculty. Also, I like to tell them that content knowledge still matters. It's not just focusing on the geotechnology tools, but content. Water, energy, population change, uh, biodiversity, other content. That still matters. So teaching these skills and nurturing these skills, but it's always in the context of a real place with real people's lives that are affected. And the geographic perspective, I would submit, matters even if you're teaching sociology or business or engineering. That geographic perspective matters, the things that you and I love indeed. And also focus on career opportunities, but not exclusively on career opportunities. That's why many people want to go into geospatial technology, as you folks know in this community, but also thinking about that's not the only thing to focus on. We want to solve problems in our world. We have some variables in our world that are going in the wrong direction, right? Ocean acidification and many others that we could chat about. So we're trying to change the direction that these variables are going. Yes, it's a great career skill, but remember, you're instilling students and faculty be faculty to be change agents, positive change agents in the world. So I have a whole section in this story map about employment 
and industry outlook that you can look at. My own research is probably no surprise to you all. The implementation and effectiveness of teaching and learning with geospatial technology. So this is one of my articles about that particular topic. So that's my own research in this field is teaching and learning effectively with geotechnologies. I'm very passionate about that as I hope that this uh, is showing. But also strategies that reflect the changing nature of GIS. What should students learn? Let's think, let's think outside the box here. We've got this big paradigm shift that has happened in geospatial, right? With web-based GIS and data services and so on. So that's a good opportunity for us to think about, okay, let's let's consider maybe we shouldn't teach this like we have in the past. Maybe there are certain things that really need to be changed. And my colleague David DiBiase even wrote an essay about stop teaching GIS. The point, I think, when that if with that uh, sort of out of the box challenging title is we still use GIS in instruction to be sure. But his point was, and my point here is also the, similar, and that is let's teach about problem solving, inquiry, uh, forming good questions, et cetera. We're using GIS as an instructional tool and they're also learning about GI science while they're doing it. Learning how to learn, I think is the is the key here. I love showcasing student work. It's not just me and my team saying rah, rah, you know, ESRI education team. No, it's the focus is on the awesome things that students are doing with this. And I was involved with a project called Data Citizens where students collected data on storm drains, something that many communities kind of take for granted. Oh, there's a storm drain. But actually, it's a very fundamental part of water quality and uh, natural hazards mitigation, mitigating floods, et cetera. Uh, so they're important parts of the community, even if they're taken for granted. And so we map those. The students actually got a tour of their local wastewater treatment plant. The teachers got involved, science and social studies. So again, uh, breaking down barriers. And this is a secondary school project that university instructors were involved with and I was involved with on the uh, industry side. We make dashboards like this. The students made these dashboards as well. And I love this uh, particular story map where a student actually took a drone at a secondary school and flew the drone of uh, the UAV on the campus and got permission to do that and created a campus map that the campus infrastructure people, the facility managers then started using for campus safety, mapping all the campus infrastructure, light poles, building outlines, etc. Now this this particular story map from a student in Canada uh, I love it because at the end of the of the story map, and as you probably suspect, where are the whales? Uh, where do they go? Uh, let's map the locations of these things. But at the end of the story map, I really like that the student came up with a conclusion that was based on a recommendation. Well, let's do something about this. Remember the action component. We're not just gaining head knowledge about whales in this case, but the, a lot of these whales were getting caught in lobster traps. So the student came up with a solution based on the student's research about maybe we could design a different kind of lobster trap where the whales won't get st stuck in these things, get trapped in these things. So I love that whole action uh, component. And I've met lots of educators like Eric Bushland here that let the students fly. They're teaching Python, they're teaching coding, they're teaching animation. A lot of the students want to be filmmakers. So they're using some animation tools in conjunction with geotechnology as well. The landscape of primary and secondary education, in that regard, my team works in collaboration with educators. There is slow but steady progress, and this is multi-country. It's not just the USA. But just taking uh, this as an example, uh, for example, every single little geeky red schoolhouse, I know this is a kind of a geeky symbology on this map, but every one of these schoolhouses represents an educator or a school that's using geospatial technology. And you can see there are a lot of them. We're making progress. We've got a long way to go, and it's not just our team, but it's in collaboration with educational associations and others. Mostly geospatial technology at primary and secondary globally, Australia, Japan, Netherlands, Germany, elsewhere. It's used as an instructional tool to teach history or science or geography. About 10% is actually about GIS, but mostly it's used as an instructional tool in these other disciplines. At the university level, lots of progress there. I think probably all of you are aware that in 95 plus percent of universities, there's at least a geospatial course, a certificate, a micro-credential, 
an associate's degree, a, a bachelor's degree, a master's, or even a PhD in geospatial technology. That's good, and that's been longstanding. There's also, though, progress in this other aspect that I'm very passionate about, and that is infusing geospatial technology and spatial thinking in business, in engineering, in data science, especially as these universities, many of them are embracing, oh, we should have a data science program. And my advocacy is don't forget about the G part of geospatial in data science. Mm -hmm. So in these other disciplines, it's relatively small, but it is growing. And I'm I'm very happy to report that. A couple final recommendations, and we're going to have a nice chat here. I hope um, the importance of real world examples. I think one of the reasons why you and I, as believers, love geospatial technology is that it's about real people. It's helping people to build this better world. We recognize that people are facing challenges of all kinds in our world, right, from global to local scales. They can't access fresh drinking water. OK, we're working with people called the hippo roller folks to create a device that gets people to and from a water station that may be kilometers and or miles away from their where they're located uh, to get that in a more efficient way to their own household. So things like that that, are, that go beyond just the geospatial part, but it's actually taking taking action. Um, pose questions and model inquiry. We're always telling people go beyond the software. Yes, you need to use the tools, but remember there's a higher, more noble goal. Also, where there's a geospatial librarian on a university campus makes a big difference. So I'm always advocating deans, provosts, and department heads at universities to get a geospatial librarian that oftentimes is tasked with spreading geospatial throughout a campus. And also don't overstress about the latest and greatest version of the tools. The tools change. Remember this tool right here is the one I'm always stressing that is the most important one. There are numerous hands-on examples, the Living Atlas apps. I love using those, the water balance app, the Wayback imagery, the Sentinel-2 um, land cover change. These are things that you don't need to sign into anything to use, but they're very engaging, dynamic tools that can be great resources for instruction. And there's lots of others in this story map that I'll share in the chat box here in a moment. Be a geo mentor, teach an after school club. Lots of ways that you can actually, you in the geospatial professional world can connect with educators. Uh, and so lots of opportunities for you to connect with the education and community. And then finally, do you have time to connect? Hey, Joseph, you've got a full-time job doing this. Uh, I'm I'm working in a government agency or a nonprofit or a private industry. I don't I don't have a task on my to-do list every week to connect with educators and spread the good word about why this matters in in education and society. I recognize that, so we can chat about well, what can you do in your role to nudge the needle forward on the adoption of geospatial in education. What's the return on investment? Well, I just like to say this. What's the con what are the consequences for not reaching the educational community? It's vitally important to our future, as you know. And are you the right person to be involved with education? I submit that you're all leaders in the geospatial technology field. And so if not you, then who, right? If we are, you all are the leaders in this area. How many of you feel 100% adequate that you can actually be working with educators? Well. I would just ask, uh, submit this. I read a book not too long ago where the author said, I don't feel fully adequate in my profession yet. I don't feel like I fully arrived yet in the, the life's work that I felt compelled to do. That was the Paul McCartney A to Z lyric book. If Sir Paul doesn't feel completely adequate as a songwriter yet, my goodness gracious, uh, then it's, it's okay for us to feel inadequate at certain days in our jobs. So don't wait until that moment you feel fully adequate as a geospatial professional. As we know, we need each other, right? There are things that, hmm, I'm not quite sure how to do this. And I've been using GIS probably since before many of you were born in the 20th century. And I still rely on the community to help me get unstuck when I get stuck. So that's, a, that's I think, a, hopefully a word of encouragement. We're never going to have enough time, um, conductor Leonard Bernstein uh, Boston Philharmonic. We need to, a plan, but also not enough time. We're never going to have enough time to do all of these things that we want to do, but we make time for what's important, and I think geospatial education is important. I like to focus on these top five skills, having students be curious about the world, 
being able to work with data. And I've got a whole geospatial data blog, which I know sounds really dry and boring, but it's all about where to find data, how do I know if it's any good, and the ethical implications of using GIS. Copyright, location privacy, and many other, uh, the ethics of making, of making maps. So hopefully that's a good resource. And then also know your foundations. Again, we as the geospatial community, we have a good opportunity now to show some leadership to people that want to do a little bit of mapping and they see the value of it in business, sociology, and other disciplines, but they don't they don't have a grounding in this like you and I do. So it's again a, a, a nice opportunity for us to uh, show some leadership there. And then also be adaptable. I know many of you on the call are international. You're from many different places around the world. And I also say that if you're not, uh, you know, if you don't have the opportunity to travel internationally, then at the next conference, go outside your comfort zone and go to a track in a conference where it's completely outside your own wheelhouse. You don't know anybody there. I did this at a recent geography conference. I went to the social work track. I didn't know anybody. I learned about you know, their methods. I met some new people. It was fascinating. So go outside your com disciplinary comfort zone. I also love this, and I like to share this with students and faculty. This Ikigai diagram from the, from the Japanese. What do you love to do? What are you good at? What can you be paid for? And what does the world need? Try to be at that center. Now, am I at the center of that every day on the job? No, I mean, this is a great moment today getting to speak with all of you, but try to strive to be at the center of that. And I, I like to advocate for students to do that. And then finally, remember my elevator speech, nurture good communication. People still need to art, be able to articulate why this matters to society. Because again, mapping and geospatial, it's sort of like the sand in the conglomerate, right? Where you've got cobbles and boulders in that, sand, in that conglomerate. The cobbles and boulders are established disciplines that a lot of people understand. Oh, I, I kind of have an idea of what chemistry is or physics or mathematics. Geospatial and geography even is sort of like the sand grains that that touch all of those disciplines. It's its own discipline to be sure on its own, but it also touches others in this way that's kind of hard to grab, like a sand in the conglomerate. You, the, the grains kind of slip between your fingers, right? So I think you need to still be able to articulate why this matters. And in conclusion, I truly believe, folks, that this decade will be very exciting for geotechnologies. Yes, we have a lot of problems. Yes, we've got challenges, but we have a good community. We have good data. We have good people. And we have a goal of, right, of, of making this world a better place to be and that we're going to make wiser decisions for a healthier, happier, and more sustainable future. I hope that wasn't too many words. Here's me out in the field and with my geography tie on. Um, at 100 degrees west longitude. And what's not to love about that? Questions, comments, complaints, I'd love to hear from you folks. How are you folks doing? Yes, well, thank you, uh, Joseph. That was uh, indeed were a lot of words, uh, but thank you for, for your enthusiasm. Um, and I, I was, um, dur during your talk, I, I was remembered um, ab about a, a phrase uh, I, I once heard at a conference, and they say, well, people, are they interested in drills or are, are they interested in holes? Um, so, and, and then they said, well, people are interested in the holes, uh, and so don't advocate your, um, your tools too much. Um, but of course, there's uh, and the other way around. There, there's also discussion. What is an effective uh, tool to use? Um, so that's a good one. Thanks for sharing yeah. that, Vincent. I'll, I'll have to use that in the future. Yeah, yeah, and 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 maybe that, that's also so, also a point uh, we would like to make is okay. Of course, you can you can use a, a screw uh, driver uh, to to uh, cut a hole in the wall. Uh, but it's more effective to to use a drill, and um, as, especially if you want to use a GIS, uh, that's a, that can also be very effective. Um, and uh, another thought which came to my mind is, um, and of course I'm Dutch, so we are always very critical. So uh, be warned. Um, but but um, during your talk, I, I thought. OK, yes, of course, we want to make this a, a, a better place, the, the, this world. 
uh, because I also believe uh, th this world is uh, is loved by uh, by God, and uh, we see. Uh, uh, but 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 sometimes it also feels a, a bit conflicting, uh, in because uh, GS tools can also be used uh, to harm people. So it's. I think the tool itself is 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 neutral, and and how do we balance this? And I think that's that's also an, an important thing in in educate, uh, yeah, educating people. How to do and and it's also the ethical part. I think how do we get uh, people uh, in, into an yeah critical mind uh, and, and using uh, the tools uh, critically uh, to to make people flourish? Uh, I, I would say yeah. Well, I get this quite a bit, actually, Vincent, and uh, sharing a few things in the chat box here. But on your point of, hey, Joseph, don't you know that uh, some of these geotechnologies are being used to harm people, uh, drone strikes, et cetera? I'm like, yes, uh, to your point, ev just about every invention has as wonderful as photography is, right? It, it can be used to harm miners, right, et cetera. Geospatial as well, but 99%, right, is the Jane Goodall Elephant Foundation, it's the World Health Organization, it's the Catholic Relief Services, it's the Habitat for Humanity. It's it's overwhelmingly a technology for good, and so that's why I like to focus on. And if people don't agree with certain businesses around the world, uh, I also like to get them to think about the following, especially because students are so oftentimes thinking about Okay, well, we, 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 I don't like mining. We shouldn't have any mining. Oh, okay. Well, give me your phone then, because we can't just manufacture all this stuff. Something has to be extracted. And on the geotechnology te part, if there's a mining company, I want them to use geospatial technology, right? I want them to make the smartest decisions possible while we're still extracting things. So I like to get students to think about, yeah, there's a comp there's a complex world out there and we need to be as smart as possible making decisions. And I truly believe that students spatial thinking with geotechnology is, is going to get give them the, the confidence and the ability to be positive change agents. So, yeah, I'm loving what you're saying. Okay. Are there other people who uh, do have some, uh, some and questions? I hope you get the sense. Yeah, while you folks are thinking of other questions, when I go to campuses, conferences, et cetera, I'm not just talking about geotechnologies. I'm I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, what are your challenges and giving them some encouragement, you know, during the day, even if it's the only time they're ever going to see me on campus in the next, you know, 10 years. And hopefully I'll be back. But you know what I mean? I don't know how many years I'm going to be given on this planet to do this. So while I'm still doing this, I'm trying to make as positive a, of an influence as possible. And it's just very gratifying when people say, Oh, Joseph, thank you so much for visiting our campus. We were very encouraged, you know, to, beyond the geotechnical, you know, ta talks that we we have. It's if they're encouraged and they they see maybe a, a brighter future to me, that that is worth more than but now they know a little bit more about how to create a web mapping application. You know what I mean? I, I love that part, but it's it's this bigger sort of image of themselves, you know, confidence going forward that I'm trying to do my utmost to uh, share with them. Yeah. yeah. Joseph, not so much a question, but just want to give you a word of encouragement. Uh, my son graduated from a charter school and um, in, in the course of his time there, we had an opportunity to share on a GIS day and I used a number of your ideas from various videos and uh, trying to encourage them and um, increase their enthusiasm for GIS and it's really helpful. Uh, you're a real geo evangelist in my eyes. Thanks so much for what you do. Oh, Matt, thanks so much. And if you're in the DFW area, that teacher that I touched on in the um, in the story map is what, taught at Saxe High School in uh, North Dallas um, for okay. many years. Yep, he, Eric Bushland, and uh, he's he's so passionate that. It officially retired, but now he's like, what else can I do with geospatial, right? It's just like all of us. It's like, ooh, let's just move on to the next adventure, which I think is a very interesting part of the geospatial community, right? It's that we're all very, very passionate about this. You've never really meet anybody that, oh, you know, I did GIS for a while and and it was boring and I didn't like it, right? They're all very it's not like you can't leave. It's not like the Hotel California, right? You can't, it's not like you can leave, you, you cannot leave, but usually people that go on to another 
thing, they're using geospatial. Like we've had a few people leave ESRI, sure, but they're in like environmental planning or something, and they're using it in their business that they started for themselves, that type of thing. So it's a it's a really fascinating community, and that would be an interesting uh, study that a sociologist or, or behavioral psychologist could do about, you know, People gather, you know, there's 20,000 people at the ESRI user conference. Why, why do they do that? They're not just learning tech. It's it's the community, right? That there's there's something bigger than themselves, and which I, I love about this, what I love about you all. So, and it's great to know that you, fo you folks are out there. Um, you know, you care about people. You care about the planet. You know that we're here for a reason. Just It's just great to be connected with you all on, on that level. I don't often get to talk about that, but, you know, directly uh, in, you know, the day-to-day -day work. So this is just wonderful to be together. Hopefully you can hear me. Can you guys hear me? Okay? Yeah. Hey, hey, Michael. Yep. Hey, Joseph. Thank you so much. That was uh, great. And uh, one thing I've learned about you is you are very articulate, which I love. Um, I'm not sure I'm that articulate, but hopefully I can uh, pose a question that will make sense. Um, you did talk about the, the G part of IS or BI or whatever. I'm just kind of curious. Um, what the uptake is as far as universities go, because obviously in the industry, we see a lot of um, heightened interest in business intelligence. And, and those that that lingo really um, resonates with leadership, right? Business intelligence, I, I know what that means. You know, there's some business problem and we're bringing some intelligent thing to it. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I'd say that obviously GIS sits very firmly in that school of business intelligence, but it's not often recognized as that, you know, people go, oh, business intelligence is one thing, geospatial is something completely different. How has the industry or how has uh, the university setting helped to bring that together if they have? And uh, what's the proposals I'm wondering from Esri side of things to change GIS because I don't think honestly that that acronym works anymore yeah, you know it doesn't explain anything I don't use it that much anymore I say geospatial mostly now in my you know in my work so I'm just curious to hear from your perspective well that was very articulate Michael oh, thank you so much um, <laughs> I'm going to share this this I'm going to share screen here for a moment um, this article that I just shared in the chat box is not the end all be all, but to your point, A, yes, every school of business has business pretty much. Their web pages are all about business intelligence. We want to empower people, students to make a you know positive difference in the in their world in, in the in the business business world. S but the, the, the interesting thing and the challenging thing is that to your point. They say business intelligence, and there's almost very little, there's usually very little phrasing, words, et cetera, paragraphs on geospatial technology or location intelligence is really what they loved using in this school of business. So I wrote this article uh, about examples of the use of GIS in university schools of business, and I wanted to feature small schools like uh, University of Redlands. Where they've got this so, uh, society, business and society focus, and they're using geospatial, but also mid-sized universities. There's James Madison in Virginia, uh, global su supply chain management. That's their focus there. And then big ones like Arizona State, apply business data analytics certificate, and with with several courses. And they're using tools like Business Analyst Web. But most imp most importantly, though, it's the small, medium, and large. So it spans the enrollment, and the second thing to point out is, like we were talking about before, I can't go in there and say, well, you need to be using GIS in your supply chain courses. Or, no, it's what are you teaching? So listening to them, where where in the curriculum are the students not engaged or you're not happy with the curricular materials or you're using some static map or some tool that you don't think is going to be around in the future? So trying to find the logical touch points and say, okay, in next semester, in week five of your supply chain course, consider these resources that my team in collaboration with other university instructors have built for you. So in other words, they don't have to then turn 100 hours in the fall semester over to learning and teaching with geospatial, but it's okay, I can plug that into week five. And that worked, and the next semester, that worked really well. 
what else can I do with this? You know, so sort of planting some seeds on the fertile ground, if you know what I mean, that can sprout and grow. And so this and the business uh, education webpage, uh, that's basically the, uh, if you'd search on these terms, business Esri education landing page, it is a, not the end all be all, but it is case studies. It's why do this, some, um, university success stories, uh, Westchester University, et cetera. And then, okay, here, give me some curriculum, uh, mat curriculum materials that I can actually use. And the nice thing too, is that on the, on the tool aspect, most of these universities already have these tools at their fingertips. They're just not using them. They already have a university site license for all, for example, the ESRI technology set of tools. So it's just a matter of helping them to see, okay, in this course, I can use this in this way. So again, it's 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 a big challenge that you're talking about, but I keep thinking, you know, if, if we even get 10% of faculty and students in the schools of business to use this, I mean, first of all, just think of the more sustainable business decisions that are going to be made. And then secondly, if a business doesn't have a sustainability plan now, they're going to have to have one in the future. And who better to get to get them there than these students empowered with these tools? And just on the on the last note there, Arizona State University, for example, has 6,000 students in their school of business, 6,000 just in their school of business and ditto for a lot of other universities around the world, right? Their schools of business are huge. So if we can get just a fraction of those students and faculty using this, that could be really effective in turn. Numbers aren't everything I recognize, but it could be a very uh, strong leap forward. So I'm right with you. Um, it, it is, it is, and that's one of the things why it's a, a long-term uh, partnership with these schools of business and, and others that shows, okay, we're going to be there in in the future. We're going to be there for you. And there are schools of business faculty that are effectively doing this. So pointing to those people and how, not just what their successes, but what were their challenges? And another thing that we do also is, for example, near uh, Matt, TCU University in Fort Worth, we actually have a, 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 a supply chain competition where we get, you know, Esri's got a lot of business partners actual people that in in the business world that use the geospatial so we're connecting those students that that use it in the university with not only submit your you know web map and your application your your project to this competition but connect with these businesses for for internships and actual jobs so get that pipeline going right there in the university so that's been a, a joy to get that going in several different campuses too so thanks for thanks for bringing this up it's a very important part of our mission Hey, we're at an hour. So sorry. The time already passes so quickly with with all these good people on here. But uh, Vincent, what what else should we chat about or closing yeah, words from you? Yeah, well, I think there's one que a question from Matt. Uh, the URL for your blog about finding data sources and knowing their credibility. Uh, can you elaborate on your question, Matt? Yeah, that's just above your question there, Matt. It's it's the spatial reserves data blog, which I know sounds really this sounds really boring, Ooh. but I wasn't sure if they were one in the same or not. Yeah, yeah, it's it's right below the story map that I just shared uh, as well that link. So I hope it's useful. It, I, I wrote I write each one of those essays in there so that an instructor or, you know, you in the geospatial professional world can take and it's it's understandable to people without GIS knowledge. I try to write them without a bunch of jargon, so they're just very focused. Um, and hopefully relevant and interesting. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, you already mentioned it, so we, we are uh, about to uh, to reach reach uh, the top of the hour. Um, so I, I really want to thank you for your inspiring and uh, uh, yeah, uh, you you just overwhelmed us with with a lot of uh, uh, words. Uh, but but I, I think it was really inspiring and uh, a lot of people uh, also had the opportunity to ask questions. Um, maybe if they want to reach out, I think your email is also uh, they can reach out to you with, with other questions. Um, and uh, for uh, the next uh, webinar, which will be on the, the 19th of uh, December, I think uh, we will have um, Matt Benjamin. 
Uh, and he will talk uh, about mapping the world's uh, languages. And Meta is, work, uh, Meta is working for SIL uh, in, in Bible translation and as, uh, as a cartographer. So I think we can also uh, look forward to another uh, really interesting uh, webinar. Uh, so I hope to see you all then uh, uh, again. So thank you all uh, for joining us and especially to you, Joseph, for uh, uh, doing this, uh, this webinar. It was a huge honor. Thanks, folks. I know that you are all positive change agents, so I just wish you all the best in your future journeys, and I'm sure we'll be in touch. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. Appreciate tot, it. Tot zines, Joseph. Vincent. Vincent, tot zines. Tot zines, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay.